Greetings friends, welcome again to Sovereign Grace Doctrine and we, go, we again thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to watch our videos and we pray that our Bible studies be a blessing to those that are following along. We continue here in 1 Corinthians, entering into the 6th chapter now. We're going to back up to verse 12 and ver, uh, chapter 5 and read to verse 12 of chapter 6. Uh, he says here in chapter 5 verse 12, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without judge, uh, God judges. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust, and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertaineth to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, Set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one, that shall be able to judge between his brother, or his brethren, but brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because ye go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, ye do wrong, and defraud, and that your brethren. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor infeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. As he is <clears throat> speaking of judgment there at the close of chapter 5, <clears throat> it is the judgment of wicked persons, and as we continue to see in this book of Corinthians, that the church at Corinth had many issues, many problems. And as they were dealing with wicked persons that were walking with them, side by side, and they should deal with those wicked persons, and uh, to be, as we speak of church discipline, they should took action against them, and pass judgment upon them, and turn them over to Satan, that they, the flesh might be destroyed, that the soul might be saved. And now he begins, we get into chapter 6 here now, where he turns to another matter uh, in them, and that is, a brother goeth to brother, or goeth to law against a brother. And truly what a sad state for any church to be in were that brethren who worship together side by side, who worship the Lord, would be at odds one to, with another to the point where they would actually go to the law of the land and the courts to sue their brother. When we ought to love one another, care for one another, look out for one another, we ought to esteem others more than ourselves. All these things that are taught to us in the Word of God, but yet sometimes we see people, and we've seen this in our life, people that get beside themselves, and you, you try to reason with them and to show them from the Scriptures, that, well, brother, this is not the spirit that you ought to have toward a fellow Christian, even especially a member of this church where you go, but they get beside themselves and so determined, and it's a prideful spirit, that gets us here that we want to have our way and we want to have uh, we want to be justified in the eyes of others and we feel someone's done wrong to us 
and uh, but we ought to bring them before the church even as the scriptures tell us to that when there is a fault between us between brethren that it's not the law of the land that we should go to such as what they're doing here where as he said there any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints God's people are all considered to be saints and if we have issues one with another then we ought to by the grace of God be able to resolve those issues we ought to be able to go to our brother or your sister in the faith and you know between men and women women and men and whatever direction the faults may lie by the grace of God if we have the right spirit within our hearts and minds we ought to be able to go and speak one another and uh, to reasonably discuss and discern the matters which are between us and if we you know we'll ask ourselves am I at fault in this we ought to step down from that high horse and the prideful condition where we may find ourselves Humble ourselves before the Lord and say, Lord, help me to see, am I at fault here? Am I the one that needs to make this right when a brother comes to us? Or even before we go to a brother, we ought to examine ourselves. Make sure that we're not the one on the wrong side of the issue. But God's people, the saints of God, we ought not go outside the authority of the church and that church is being that local visible body the so-called universal invisible church cannot do what's being talked about here they cannot gather together all the saints of God that are alive even in the day that we're living to judge any matter of, of, for all the saints is just not possible the church system is a local visible institution and this is what he's talking to he's talking specifically to the church at Corinth not the so-called general church of all the firstborn, all the believers. But to this assembly, this specific group of people, this is the type of church which Jesus started. And it's made up of his saints, true believing Christians who have been baptized with believer's baptism. And we are all put together in that church, whether it's this church at Corinth, whether it's Ephesus, whether it's where you're at or where I'm at here in Kentucky. The church is where God has placed us at. That is where we are fit together with those people. And where I'm at, I'm not fit together with you where you're at. And where you're at, and you should be a part of a local, visible, true New Testament church that probably would call itself a Baptist faith, or the Baptist faith and doctrine, because the Baptists are the ones who have the closest walk with faith and understanding the Scripture than anyone else out there. Uh... But as the saints of God being brought together in these local visible assemblies and we have faults between ourselves. As he teaches over in Matthew, uh, I believe it is, or in the Gospels you might say, that when you have a fault with your brother, you go to him and you speak to him or your sister and the faith and you try to work these things out. And if they won't hear you, then you go get two other brethren to go with you that so in the mouth of two or three witnesses that all the things might be declared and the truth of it might be set before the congregation if it needs to go that far and if still yet uh, with you and the two other brethren to go with you if God won't hear the, if, the, if the person won't hear the three of you then you bring them before the church they're so set besides themselves and this is where you know and by the time it gets to this if it gets to this that brother who it is has gone too far that's so I'm going to go out here and I'm going to get me a lawyer and I'm going to take you to court and I'm going to get my just reward out of you, what I think you owe me. But we ought to be able to settle this within the church, within that local body of believers and the saints of God. For we will, as he speaks of it here, say, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? Do we not understand this? That God, even our Lord and our Savior, is going to put us in positions of judgment to where that we will judge the world. We'll be priests and kings. We'll reign and rule over this world along with our Savior. We will, uh, you know, we will be his servants in that matter. That we will go forth and enforce his will, bring about his judgment, and minister the people of this world according to his plan and purpose during that millennial reign. But we will judge the world along with our Lord and our Savior, along with God. When God 
uh, when Jesus sits on the throne, and he is God, when he sits on the throne of his judgment, and he passes judgment upon this world, we're not going to be sitting there shaking our heads, and, oh, I don't think that's right. No, we're going to say, hey, man, to it. We're going to rejoice in it, for our God is just. He is holy. There is no shadow of turning in him. There is no unrighteousness in him. And it will be a just and holy judgment, which is brought upon this world, and we will be in agreement with it. We'll say, even so, Lord Jesus, let it be. He says, and if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest of matters? We who are saved by the grace of God, the saints of God, and especially those who are part of that local visible institution, which is his church, we have this great responsibility to judge the matters that are amongst us. And at times, ever so often, there are matters of business that are brought before the assembly of the Lord's people that we might decide this or that. Sometimes it has to do with the building we're in we worship and the upkeep of it. Sometimes it has to do with the financial affairs of paying somebody to do something to that building and that structure. Sometimes it has to do with uh, supporting a missionary to a foreign field or even in the, own, the country where you may be at. But in all these matters, we have to pass a judgment. We have to vote. And this is one of the things we're in the Baptist have it right. Uh, we're not ruled by an upper level of, of uh, hierarchy, what I call a hierarchy. There's no men outside the local church that are over us that dictates to us. Christ is the head of the church. And in the church, he has placed a pastor over that church, a pastor, not a set of pastors, not a presbytery. This is not the pattern set forth in the Word of God. But each church being autonomous unto itself, following the pattern of scriptures, that in each church there is that need of judgment to pass and uh, judgment on matters, to vote on things. And that we see, you can see, and you can read in the book of Acts, to where they all voted on the matters. They all voted on that one. It would take Judas' a spot. They all voted and uh, nominated those men that would take the positions of deacons in the church to help the widows. It was put before them, choose out from among yourselves these men that you'd find worthy and qualified to do this thing. It wasn't those uh, apostles as it was at that time. We don't have apostles anymore. That uh, Their days are gone. But they had the apostles, and after that we have pastors, and we have deacons, and that's all the only two offices we have now. But in the matters that are before the church, they even in their time, the apostles turned it over to the people and said, Ye choose out from among yourselves. You choose and you vote. And even much more so today, our pastors lead us as they follow the Lord. And as they follow the Lord, we should follow them. And they counsel us. They give us instruction uh, when it deals with matters of faith and practice. Certainly herein is our final authority, the Word of God. Uh, if it has to do with what color we're going to paint the, the walls in the church, pastors say, well, whatever you decide. You people have to decide these things. What are we going to paint the outside? And what are we going to do here or do there? For the upkeep of the facility wherein we meet and the grounds and all these things, these are not doctrinal. They're carnal, earthly things. But in matters, in, the, in this case here where it appears, there is definitely that situation where there's a fault between two brethren and uh, one or both of them even are rushing to the law instead of coming and following the biblical standard set before us that we would uh, bring them before the church, that the church might help us to reason as we ought to and to love one another as we ought to, that we might uphold the standards of Christ that is set before us herein, that we might be Christ-like, and that we love one another and care for one another, and we not get beside ourselves and have pride build up within us, and, uh, and then there's envy and hatred and all these things that come to play in the matters, well, somebody's done something wrong to me, or somebody owes me something, and they won't give me that which is justly mine. They won't give me the honors due to me. So this one runs off to the courts of law, not knowing and understanding the great responsibility that we as the saints of God have, that even the smallest matters in this life we ought to be able to judge amongst ourselves. So he says then in verse 3, Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more the things that pertain to this life? Think about that. That we will also judge angels. Fallen angels will pass judgment upon them. 
Some people wrongly state that all my loved ones become an angel. You, you're bringing them down to a lower state. Scriptures teach that we're going to be above the angels. We, are, you know, we that are right now, we're in a state that's lower than them. And Christ dying for us, that we might be uh, that inheritance of his, that we might be with him in glory. And that here we are, here the angels are, and he's going to take us and put us up here above them. And the angels look upon this with, uh, they don't understand it. They understand what is this that God should do for such a lowly creatures that he's going to, that he's given his only begotten son to redeem them from their fallen and undone state and he's going to elevate them above us. He's going to elevate us, the saints of God. We're going to be in a position above the angels in authority and rule. And we will rule over them. We'll rule over this world. And we'll pass judgment upon the fallen angels in that coming estate. And how much more the things that pertain to this life. During that millennial reign, we will reign and rule with him as priests and kings. We will bring forth the judgment, which is according to his will, not our own. Uh, our, ma our thoughts and opinions no longer going to really, you know, right now, uh, times when we consider things like this, even. And I know even out there, as all those that were listening to these things, everybody has an idea, everybody has an opinion. But yet, brethren, we always need to fall back on this one thing, the scriptures are not any private interpretation. And that there are righteous things that we ought to hold to, and there's ungodly things we ought to set aside, not be a part of them. And that we ought to strive for the example that's set before us, that is even in Christ Jesus our Lord and Savior, that we would strive to be more, be more like Him in all things in this life. Knowing that this is the condition, even as, he, even as he's spoken of here, that we're going to be in that condition in the life to come, that we're going to be in a position of judgment over angels and over this world, so that even in this life, that even the smallest matters of things, we ought to be able to reason within ourselves and judge the matters together in a way that glorifies God. He says, If then ye, ha <clears throat> if then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, Set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. When it really gets to, and I don't know that I can, you know, I really haven't seen a matter come forth like this in any of the churches that I've been in in my life so far. To where that a, a, a situation arises between two people. To where that they're, they're minded to go to court over because, well, one or both of them is being disagreeable to the point where they can't work it out. And that they should then, both of them, bring it before the church and say, even as they would, uh, the people of Israel would in the days of old brought it before Solomon and say, here it is. You that are wise as us, help us settle this matter. But when it comes to bringing it before the church, and there has to be a local visible body for you to bring it unto them, that they might judge the matter, the universal and visible thing cannot and will not ever be able to do such thing. Uh, but the judgment, this judgment that is here, he said, choose out those that are least esteemed among you. Not the leaders of the church. Not even, he's not even, even the pastor's being set aside here because he's, he's the one we all look to. So not the pastor, not the deacons, not the uh, most influential in the church, but the poor and the lowly and the ones that are least esteemed and least perhaps uh, appreciated amongst us, that they might be chosen then to say, you vote, you, you be the ones that will make the decision this matter. And yeah, even a, a group of them being to a certain number that would be able then to bring forth a decision in the matter, and hear all the matters from both sides, and to then pass a decision upon it, a judgment, that the matter might be settled. He says, I speak this to your shame. And it would be to the shame of any of God's people who are at such an odds one with another that they can't work out their matters in their life, and that especially if they don't want to bring it to the church. 
So, brethren, help us to settle this matter, so that there be no division amongst us, so that we might have that unity which we strive for, and that together we might show forth the love of Christ unto all those round about us. For, friends, let us always remember this, that the sinful world round about us is watching everything we do, and that they and those neighbors, especially those that are closest to the church, and those that live next to you, and uh, that uh, surely one way or another they hear and they see, and they, uh, you know, it gets out, word gets out, there are those that talk, and they know of the divisions in your church. And when church divides, and some of them go over here, and some go over there, or, or some stay where they're at, and others leave out and go over yonder somewhere, well, it ain't long until people realize, hey, where all them cars go? There's not quite as many people over there as there used to be. I wonder what will happen to them. But my friends, the ungodly world round about us is watching everything we say and do and the life we live before them. And we ought not bring matters that are between us as saints of God before the unjust to rule over them. So it's not just the legal system and the ungodly and unrighteous out there that we, he's talking about them going to to rule over the matter, but that we might also realize that all those that are round about us out there, and uh, when, once you go to the law... It's publicized. Then it's made known to the city and the community wherein you live. And it'll spread out from there as well. Did you know what happened over such and such church? And uh, how that they got caught up in a legal matter in the, in the courts and all this so much? It is to our shame. It is to our shame if we let matters between us as brethren get to that point to where we cannot work it out in brotherly love and spirit of meekness that Christ might be glorified in all things that we do. He says, It is so that there is not a wise man among you. Yes, and that would be true. If we are so beside ourselves and so emotional, so caught up in the matters, that we can't sit down and pray to God and, and listen one to another and be willing to consider our faults one with another, and we're in that one or both sides in this matter, or any matter, might have faults that are adding to it and multiply it, and it is as a leaven, it will spread, it will affect other members of the church, because you know you've got to be talking about two individuals who, they could be the same family, or they could be two separate families, which it's two separate families, and it's going to spread and affect more members of those families that be a part of the body. And it sets them at odds with one another, and it leads to a division then, or would lead to a division, within a church as it is. But it's, if there is no willingness and ability to bring it and to reason it out, then it shows that there's none wise among you. That you're not being wise, you're being foolish to carry on like this. You're not being Christ-like. He said, no, not one that shall be able to judge between his brother." What a sad state for this church to be in, that they were so unwise, bring shame upon themselves, that they cannot bring this before the church and judge the matter, but they had to go to law. They had to go to outsiders and bring that matter before others who are lost and undone and know not God and not part of the local church. It says, but brother, go to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. My friends, every day that we live and go out into this world to serve our Lord and our God, we ought to be mindful of how we conduct ourselves before others. Do we laugh at the filthy jokes and actions that are talked about by others? Do we show a disapproval of the unrighteousness that's committed in our, in our midst? And it is abundant out there in these days in which we live, such wickedness and ungodliness. And a going away from the old standards of moral codes of law that are being cast aside for woke theology and modern teachings and things that are contrary to even common sense itself God forbid that any of us, as the saints of God, should go out and conduct ourselves before those of this world in such an ungodly manner that we bring shame upon ourselves and upon the faith which we represent and the local visible group of people which we are part of, that local visible church. But 
The matters between us should not be brought before the unbelieving in matters of law. We should not go to law one with another and bring our brother or sister before the courts and the judges of this world that are unbelieving and ungodly and cannot discern and reason in the matters according to faith. But they would pass some of the reasons of law, of course. But these things ought not be done. They ought not be between us. And this just shows forth the sad condition of Corinth. And certainly the possibility, even our day and times, you could find this in the world today, I'm sure. There are all those out there that would fit these examples and be like this. He says now in verse 7, Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you. And there is. If we, even before you get to this point, there's already a fault there and it grows and it festers. And it does get rooted within the hearts of people where they're set at odds one with another. And... We all know how these things are, that when you, it starts with two people, and they're at odds with one another. And, well, the one on this side, he's going to talking to others, trying to drum up support for his side. And the other one's going to talk to people, trying to drum up support for his side. And we began to go to, first, to the families. You know, if it's, uh, for, whether it's within your family, of course, you know, both are trying to reason with other family members. And, and I'm right and he's wrong. And if they're different families, then certainly it's the setting of two families against one another. But we're not content there. It goes on. We'll go to others of the church. Our bestest of friends and ones we're close to. And we'll say, do you know what so-and-so has done? And how that they won't listen to me. They won't give me my just recompense. They won't do what's right. So we go and we begin to tell others. But we need to always remember this. When someone comes down to us that's the best friend, a godly person, say, did you know what so-and-so has done? That's hearsay. If you don't know it firsthand, it's hearsay. We ought not hear it. I say, brother, you ought not to be speaking like that. Whether it's true or not, I don't know it to be a fact. You're saying it don't necessarily mean it. So, uh, your opinion may be shifted, leaning toward your side of the issue and saying being possibly true for the other person. Our opinions are never set at odds against us. They're always in favor of us. So therein, and again, as I said, it is when matters are brought before us. When somebody comes telling and bearing tales of what somebody has done or is doing, that's why it says you need two or three witnesses. That's why first they're to go. They're to go and talk to them. And then you say, brother, I, I, me and so-and-so have got a fault between us. And I need you and this person to go with me and hear the matters out that you might know what's said and what's truly going on here. And then, and then it can be brought before the church that it might then be judged and reasoned out in the assembly of God's people. And those least esteemed can then be given even the responsibility to pass in this matter, whether it be, whatever it be old one between the other. We're not talking about matters of doctrinal belief here. Or, well, so, or, and it certainly shouldn't be a matter of offense. Well, he said something that offended me. Now, this is a matter where perhaps somebody done some work for someone, they didn't pay them for it. Or uh, someone sold something to them, they didn't pay for it. But it is a matter that one would normally find themselves going to the courts of law in this world, if it be the unjust and the wicked, they go to courts to settle such things as this. But those personal actions and things that offend and uh, that we take a fault in, take offense in, these are that's not what's really going on here. But it has to be something that's looked upon as you owe me this because of that. 